gathered together this band of, of men. They were kind of like miscreants and ne'er-do-wells and bandits who'd been kicked out of their previous communities. And um, they all went together and founded a new city, and they had not brought any women with them. So they kidnapped some women from a nearby community and made them their wives. And um, all these kidnapped women were now married, quote unquote, to these yeah. men and lived with them and had children with them. And in the meantime, their fathers and brothers and previous husbands and existing family members prepared to go to war against the Romans. And the women who were now like embedded in this culture and had children with the Romans had to step between the two groups and beg them to stop this war. Oh, so, God. yeah. So that's one role that women were, you know, supposed to have that I picked yeah. up from this story as kind of influencers, peacekeepers, extreme heavy lifters in terms of emotional labor. Yeah, for real. Like, in okay. horrible circumstances. <laughs> yeah, like, that's just terrible planning. You decide to start a city and you don't bring any women and you're like, oh, let's just go steal some. Like, that's the right. worst, <laughs> worst vacation planning ever. Women are um, property. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'd be interested to know, like, I've heard versions of this story. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, I remember one of them is in the... The musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Have yeah. either of you ever seen that one? I vaguely remember that, um, but yeah. I think that is kind of similar from what I remember. Yeah, I think that they were using that as maybe like the, the bass material, but there's a song in that musical called The Sovereign Women. Oh. That they make <laughs> it all sound like... like these guys don't know that it's supposed to be pronounced Sabai and ha 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 and it's like a funny story and they sing this kind of like hearty wholesome song about the Sovin women. Oh boy. And yeah. That's super yeah, dark. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I mean I, in the musical I can't remember who wrote that musical if it's like a Rodgers and Hammerstein or what but I mean it's all presented like very wholesome obviously. Oh. Um, but right? like I wonder if like do the ancient sources of, like, that talk about that myth, do they use words like rape? Or are they calling them, like, their wives? Like, well, how explicit are they so the about ancients, what really happened? I, I would say that I do not read Latin. So mm. what I'm getting it from is um, translations, and mostly what I get it from is, you know, 1800s translations that are in the common oh. kind of... Um, what is that? The co in the the commons, basically. Like I can just look it up online and read it. Um, right. So the translations that I've read frequently do kind of obscure that, and you know, it's okay. like it's kidnapping, you know. But yeah, you know what kidnapping is like in the ancient world. Right. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and they just were so happy about it. They had all these babies. Hooray! Ra hooray! <laughs> babies for all. Right. Hooray. I mean, yeah. So it's like. <laughs> I was just reading this article and I was trying to find it again, but it was talking about um, the giving of women as gifts and what mm -hmm. exactly that means oh, and uh, how it came down to really um, literally being like the women offering, like give, be, give, be given as an offering as a way to ensure the male's family line. And so the gift mm -hmm. is actually the ability to produce more humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. seen this show up in different parts of history that we've covered as well. Um, like uh, there's this people called the Picts in ancient Scotland mm -hmm. who supposedly had that as part of um, a founding myth that you don't get from the Picts themselves. You get from their enemies, basically, but that they had these women given to them by some people in Scotland who didn't want them to settle there. They wanted them to take these women and go settle over here, but also to um, decide on who their kings were through the matrilineal line. So it was like keeping some oh. kind of control over them. Huh. Yeah. Oh, right. And so the the Romans, being Romans, would be like, oh, yeah, thanks for this awesome gift. Totally cool, bro. Right. <laughs> but like probably those women were like kind of a big deal if they were if their bloodline was like a big part of the equation of trying to retain control. They were probably a big deal in those cultures. Yeah, like high-ranking high women, you mean. Yeah, 
I would I would think so. Um, the source that I read, I don't remember them mentioning it, but if they mention them at all, they're probably high ranking women. Another thing that I came across was in the same article about how men are rarely, if ever, given as gifts, mm-hmm. but are considered uh, the only time that you really hear like the terminology of men and gifts is when a man dies in war. It is con- like the mother is has given this gift to um, America to like die in war, you know? <laughs> and so yeah. that's like the context the of like, God. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. People so are, it's like something are, that the mother gives again. Gross. Yeah. People are people. People, listen, people are people. <laughs> <laughs> They're not you know, gifts. the ancient Romans okay. had a problem with that. <laughs> like, well, there's degrees of people really <laughs> is what they would say probably. <laughs> I think there are some people here now that would say the same thing. Oh, absolutely. I hadn't really thought too much about it, but when you were talking about um, how they went and, like, took these women as their wives, I'm really sure that there was some sort of, like, gift-giving language, as there tends to be, like, from the the taker's side. Like, oh, these were our gifts, you know. (laughs) These were our treasures you know they're not like really referred to as like we stole these women and then like forced them to have our children you know from from their own points of view in history right um, so what i remember um what i remember from reading the ancient sources and it's been a while since i actually like went back and read this in the original not latin english translation um Uh i might be screwing up the story a little bit but what from what i remember like the ancient romans were kind of proud that they went out and stole these women from these other people. And it is, you know, depicted as a violent act, but a violent act that they could be proud of because they're so intrepid and they're ah. so strong and burly and manly. Gender roles. And burly. <laughs> yes. Um, and warlike, you know, and that was a big thing about the Romans is that they were always ready. They were rough and ready to go to war and they were really good at that. They were colonizers and they'd been colonizers from the first minute. Um, yeah, totally. Good point. And, hmm. and that was something that they were proud of. I was just going to say, like, they, they went and took those women because they deserved them, I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe they so. took the land and therefore they're entitled to women. So there's, like, here another connection between, like, the women and the land, like, and being entitled to it by right way of yeah. colonization. Basically, yeah. the doctrine of discovery, but, like, back then. <laughs> What's the doctrine of discovery? Uh, the doctrine of discovery is like the um, doctrine that basically says that it's okay to take land from um, savages or heathens um, because it's God's will. Well, that is, uh, I see a lot of parallels with ancient Rome there. Be- <laughs> yeah, it definitely started, Many. it stems back <laughs> to and a little before ancient Rome. Absolutely, oh, wow. yeah. Okay. Mhm. Yeah. Oh, so this it's like an overarching philosophy that we're talking about. There's a point where it's definitely like a thing, but there were there's build up in history that justifies it becoming a thing. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. I think with the ancient Romans it was a little more cultural than religious because excuse me, they were okay with um conquered communities or colonized communities keeping their gods um a lot of the time they would take roman gods and kind of supplant them over the older Mm -hmm. gods that had been there before but it was it was more or less a polytheistic society up until christianity started really gaining steam um so i don't know that they necessarily used the justification of like imposing a religion on people as explicitly as the europeans did but i think it was Mm -hmm. like a cultural thing like we're civilized. We're going to bring civilization to you, people who can't even read or write things down and who, you know, like they yeah. had all these sort of myths about people that were really othering that kind of crop up a lot in the ancient sources. And you can see those being used as an excuse for colonization. Oh, yeah, totally. And that's what it came down to was like um, it drew a line kind of between the difference of like colonization where they come in and they allow the people to like mostly live the way that they lived before versus settler colonization which Mm -hmm. is where they straight up kill the people or move them completely out of the area that they're colonizing yeah 
it make a wasteland and call it peace kind of colonizing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the rape of the Sabine women. And th- what I picked up from that is like, have like women are supposed to be this sort of peacekeeping force, the sort of right. um, temp- sweet, soft, tempering hand that calms the male rage and desire for war and all that stuff. Um, right. Even Ugh. if you've been raped and made to bury your rapist child, even then, like, <laughs> yeah. in, in extreme circumstances. So there's a second one called The Rape of Lucretia. And oh, wow. this mm-hmm. one, yeah, this more rape. <laughs> Just yep. rape it all over the place. Awesome. Not, it, welcome, to, <laughs> welcome to ancient Rome. The situation is <laughs> suboptimal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this one takes place during a later time. So Rome had this period when it was um, a monarchy, according to the founding myths. And the monarchy period is basically pseudo history. Like it's mm-hmm. mythical. There are all these mythical kings. Um, and then there's a period where it transitioned from a monarchy to a democracy. And the democracy is what we have actual attested historical evidence for. Mm-hmm. Um, but this story, the rape of Lucretia is still um, pseudo historical or mythical. And okay. in this story, Um, there's this guy who he's the son of a king and he hears about this wife of a friend of his who's a member of the aristocracy and this wife is is her name's lucretia this lady she's um she's supposedly um extremely good and pure and she doesn't hang out and drink with her friends she just sits in a room all day by herself and weaves wool into clothes and she's just like she absolutely follows the dictates of femininity to a t she is the perfect pure chaste wonderful woman according to ancient roman standards she Lives sounds up to, boring so boring very industrious <laughs> very pure very chaste lives up to all the ideals and um she he I guess, like, is very intrigued by this description of her, and he winds up going over to his friend's house and raping her. And wow, what a, what a nice guy. So, yeah. yeah. There's, this, there's this whole story about how he wakes her up when she's sleeping, and he tells her that if she doesn't sleep with him, he's going to kill her and then kill an enslaved person in their household and put that person's body in the bed so that everyone thinks that she and him were having sex. And oh my god. Thus damaging her relationship her reputation. And so she uh, agrees to have sex with him under duress and eventually winds up having to tell her father and husband and then she takes her own life out of shame. So that's another super fun founding myth that all little girls in Rome would have heard growing up. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I don't even know what the moral of that story is supposed to be. Like, she literally didn't do anything wrong. That's the what moral of the story. What are you supposed to take story? away from that? What like, I take away from it is that it's, you know, if you want to be like the, the most, if you want to really follow the dictates of femininity, you have to die for them. Ew. Yeah. Like, you can't, you, you have, you could follow all the dictates and everything you could do everything right and something could still happen to you. And if you really want to be the chaste, pure, good woman and somebody violates you in that way, um, the only, you know, like, and, and the father and husband, from what I remember, I, it's a little bit fuzzy, but I think that they begged her not to and told her not to hurt herself. And she did anyway, from what I remember. Um, but yeah, and she's held up as like, you know, the most pure, extreme, wonderful vision of womanhood. I mean, in, in ancient sounds, Rome. It kind of sounds to me like an argument for not being the pure, chaste, perfect woman. Like, mm. she did not have a good life. Yeah. It That's definitely sounds like that today. But at the same time, like, um, I can see how it would be like if you're going to be, like, the purest, chastest, like, woman, then, you know, like you said, be ready to die for it. Mm-hmm. Um, because like men are probably going to want that and so you know don't be too like it's like the standard today where they're like wear makeup but don't wear too much makeup wear like dress (laughs) nice but don't dress too nice you know it's almost the same um lesson but like I want to say like less like 
I don't know, because it's still fucked up as a lesson today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is. Like, but like did Warning, we... we do not endorse these stories. <laughs> we do not. 